that is a prophetic word. You can be, you can be seated. Pastor Wally sent me this thing by email. So I told him, you know, I prayed. I saw, I just, you know, it was overnight, you know, during the all night. I was at home, I was praying. And I saw the email in the, you know, around 12 midnight. I just read a little bit. I didn't read it in full because I was praying. And I went to get a rest. And then later on, I now went to, the host said, go and look at that thing properly. So when I now looked at it properly, I now called Pastor Wally and said, you have, he said, he said, can't wait until Sunday. It has to go into the air. You see, you, a lot of us don't understand so many things. See, the preaching we are preaching here is not for you, uh, just, just us here. There are things that have to be said into the air. Because once you say into the air, you trigger something in the realm of the spirit. And three days can make a difference. The Holy Ghost has said, you cannot delay it. He must deliver that message tonight. And it's not only scripture. You, you see, it's gone into the internet. It's gone now. The audio message is already on something. It's gone on YouTube. As we speak now, it's in America. It's everywhere. That's the advantage of having the internet. Now, I want to say a few words to amplify what Pastor Wally has said and, oh, and then we're going to pray. This is a, is a present truth prophetic word. It's happening as we are speaking. And I want to say what Paul said. Let us take the most earnest need. The foolishest thing, the, the most foolish thing any Christian can do now is to neglect these prophetic words. Pastor Wale, being a gentleman, he didn't say, y'all said, oh, I don't want to say the other one. But pastor will say it. I'm like Jesus. You know, Jesus would say the two things. Say, woe to you. Same Jesus. Amen. So I'm going to say it. Now, and I'm going to say it in a positive way, you know. I'm, like Pastor Wally says, it's not gloom and doom. The first thing is, I want to go back in history a little bit because by the grace of God, I was part of it. This thing I have spoken at, uh, Pastor Wally picked up at Germany, I had mentioned it. Pastor Wally did what I expect many of us to do and do not do. He went to do his research. You know, you hear me say all kinds of things. People don't go back and think on our messages. This message is a spin-off of what I said last Wednesday. When I was saying that, this Islamic something is a result of the church not discipling the nations. So the young children, they don't see any attraction in the church. So they are not attracted by those people. And then God now blew it up in Pastor Wally's heart. He went onto the internet. He actually went to go and check. I was telling him, I said, even some things you, you've seen now, you know, I said, I never, I never even knew them. I heard from spiritual fathers, I heard it from Brother Hagen, I heard it from Colonel Copeland, I, think I heard it from my pastor, you know, because my pastor was close to Howard Carter. My pastor got baptized in the Holy Ghost, I think, in 936 or something. You know, uh, late Pastor Porter, Ms. Porter is still alive. You know, they were pals, uh, and they were a group of young Christians. They were young in those days. You know, Howard Carter started the first Bible college in Pentecostal Bible College in, in London. As far back as 1933, Howard Carter knew his the minute Adolf Hitler came into power, God told Howard Carter, you guys start interceding. It was the intercession of people like Howard Carter praying in the spirit against Adolf Hitler that God now used finally to win the war. But if there had been a praying Pentecostal church in Germany, Adolf Hitler would never even have arisen. Do you see why we have to pray about elections? Do you want to wait until you have a big problem? Very interesting when you look at the history, Pastor Wally. Hitler came he was, he was sworn into power in 1933. 
had these guys received the Holy Ghost in 1907, do you understand? They would have been strong enough through prayer and intercession and Adolf Hitler would never have come into power. I don't know how many of you know the history. I am a great student of history because history is actually his story. It's actually God ruling in the affairs of men. And I'm a great so I, if you look, if you know the if you know the history, it was almost by accident. In 1923, Adolf Hitler was arrested and put in jail after they, they had a riot in Munich. This, this, these Nazis were just a bunch of, of, of ragtag ruffians and hooligans. They locked them up. Adolf Hitler was in jail. It was while he was in jail, he wrote Mein Kampf, which is called, in German, it's called My Struggle. He began to make prophetic declarations. I will get out of jail. The German people will rise again. Through some administrative, legislative slip-ups, Adolf Hitler comes out of jail. And the German economy goes down. Because of the Versailles Treaty, Germany was supposed to pay back great amounts of money to the Allies. They didn't have the money. There was disaffection amongst the German people. This man, just a young boy oh, at that time, he was just a young man. You know, he was in his 30s and all of that. You know, they got some, I know the history because I studied it. My wife's always, I don't know why you're always watching this World War II. I said, I'm learning so many things. He, he, just to call a long story short, Hitler had nothing. He was a failed artist. He was an artist. But he, he, used to go and, he used to try and sell paintings on the streets of Austria. He was penniless. He didn't come. He came from, his father was a school teacher. His, mother, his father was very strict. He used to beat him. He didn't like his father. His mother was very nice to him. You know, he grew up a, a child. He was warped. He hated successful people. And in particular, the Jews. Very interesting. Out of Hitler's great great grandmother was Jewish. He had Jewish blood. It was one of the things that Heydrich knew and kept inside his pocket and said, I even have info. He said, I have information on everybody, <laughs> even down to the few of her. Anyway, another story for another time. So out of Hitler, he was he was just. You know, he didn't really, he didn't have anything. He didn't. So when he came out of, of jail, you know, and he began to speak on German nationalism and how they would give the people food and help and all that. Some people just looked at him and said, ah, this young man, you know that he's so something. Let's try and help him. They went to buy suit for him. Well, yes. And they just, you know, Brushed him up a little bit. Who is this here, Adolf Hitler? They brushed him up a little bit and he earned some level of respectability and then began to draw bigger and bigger crowds. And like I told you on Sunday, all those who used to go to those meetings say it's like a religious meeting. He had an anointing. So that anointing, he says, I will draw all men. Just like the Holy Spirit can draw, the Antichrist spirit too can draw. And he began to draw and he began to attract greater and greater and greater attention. Initially, he didn't talk about the Jews and all of that. It was also about the economy and about money and about, you know, helping people. And a lot of innocent, naive, like some of our Nigerians now are very naive. He that had an ear, let him hear. That's why I like history. No, naive. Very naive. There are ways he can help the economy. He can do this. He can overcome corruption. So, they began to, he began to get more and more support. He began to get more and more support. 
But he still was not powerful enough. The Nazis were seen as the, the conservatives and the, 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 the elite, the, 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 the German aristocracy. If you hear von this, von that, it means that it is somebody from the higher class. They saw him as a rude, vulgar corporal. He was only a corporal in World War II. World War One, you know, but they tolerated his manners. So what happened was this: he was urging for power. He really didn't have power. The Nazis tried to get the power. They lost the election. They couldn't win. This I'm, I'm talking about. This 1920, in the late 20s. I don't have all the dates at all at all my finger, but but it was in the late you know in the late 20s. He began to you know try and get power. He couldn't get it. So. They formed a compromise. And the compromise was this. Hitler, with his own Nazi party, without having a majority, would agree with the other, uh, one of the other parties. So Hitler now became, he became um, uh, like a kind of vice chancellor or something. And the Hindelberg was the head of state. But Hindelberg was an old man. Hindelberg died. Hitler immediately, immediately, he used the opportunity. It was just an, if people had prayed, it would never have happened. That's why I'm telling you the story. You know, he, 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 he just seized, he, he usurped, you know, to declare himself chancellor. But even then, the thing wasn't won because he had other people, Rom, and other people inside the Nazi party who were acting. Surely the people, some of the people who started, they were first of all called the brown shirts. Adolf Hitler just joined. He didn't start the Nazi party. In order to consolidate power, Adolf Hitler killed all of them. The Knight of the Long Knives. He arranged, he arranged, just like, there's no difference to Nigeria. I don't want to mention any names. Are you listening to me? But we all know of people who died. Nobody knows how they died. Till tomorrow. The same thing Adolf Hitler did. He, he, he killed Rome. Killed everybody who could oppose him. They were all killed in their beds. They started, you know what they did? The Reichstag is like uh, the Abuja House of Assembly. You know, you know, that's what they call it in German. You know, this is like a big government house. They started a fire. Mm. Nobody knows who started, who started the fire. They started a the fire. So, I don't think got up and said, just like my friend in Moscow. <coughs> We must find the people who did that fire. You who, who burned down the right stack. They did it. And then they now killed innocent people that didn't have anything to do with it. They just framed them. So when he had gotten rid of all opposition in the Nazi party, he called himself, he now said they should do election. They did. He won 98% and declared himself chancellor. Then you know what he did? He suspended, he suspended the constitution so that it would be a one-man rule. He was not, it was no longer a democracy. It now became a dictatorship. He knew exact. Let me tell you, don't be naive. Don't be naive. Adolf Hitler had a plan. And the devil helped him to anoint him. To the, he, after he declared himself um, a, a chancellor and was sworn in as chancellor in 1933, he systematically began to execute the plan he had written in Mein Kampf when he was in prison in 1923. Systematically, year by year. He didn't do everything in one day. 
He built nice road, autobahns, made Volkswagen, the people's car. Um, the economy began to pick up. Everybody began to say, what a great, even the Americans were deceived. Even the British, even the royal family. It was wise people like Winston Churchill. He hadn't yet become prime minister. Ne- Neville Chamberlain was prime minister. Winston Churchill said, this man is a rogue. You know, you know, you know how the British are. You know, Winston Churchill is somebody who, you know, he comes from a very uh, sophisticated family. He, you know, he fought, he was in the admiralty and all of that. He said, Where, who is his father? Where did he come from? What is his pedigree? Where did this, see this guy is a, is a, is a, is a rogue. But Winston Churchill was not deceived for one minute. He said, this man that, you know, that we're talking about, you know, he, said, he has suspended democracy. How did Rome die? What happened? Sensible people began to ask questions like we are doing today. Where did, where did, where did this boy, where did he come from? What happened to Rome? Who killed all those people? How come the right start fire started and nobody, ah! That of Hitler, consolidated power. 1935, he brings out what's called the Nuremberg Laws. That is the laws of racial segregation. If you are a Jew, if you are, if you are iron, if you're European, you cannot marry a Jew. How's the fuck? Ah, people from abroad were watching. Well, it can't be. He just started little by little, little by little. If you are Jewish, they will take your business, they will buy it from you, they will pay you a very small price, you know. Then they'll say because of the racial, the Nuremberg laws, you can't marry a German, you can't do this, you can't do that, give you high taxes. All very legal. Rhyme you of anything? <laughs> but it was gradual. It was just systematically. Then they will call you a political prisoner. An enemy of them and put you in a concentration camp. Initially, they didn't start burning people. They also, you know, they all put you there. If you oppose them, they'll put you there and all of that. You know, so gradually, he consolidated power. 33, 34, 35, 36, 37. Ah, it's one of the biggest lessons we must learn from history. He built, he was, his army was very, very small in 1935. Immediately started getting money. He began to build tanks, planes, U-boats. You know, U-boat means, you know, um, submarines. You know, and by 1939, he had the strongest army in Europe and began to threaten everybody. Everybody had just fought World War. World War I. World War I just ended in 19. Everybody was tired of war. Nobody wanted, and he knew the psych. Nobody wanted to fight. You know? So under the threat of war, he will uh, say, okay, okay, what do you want? He said, well, I want the Sudan land in Czechoslovakia. It's just like, you know, the, the head of state of Nigeria now saying, I want uh, Benin Republic. All the Yoruba speaking people in Benin Republic, they are Yorubas. So we want them under the Nigerian Republic to join their brothers in Nigeria. They are Yoruba speaking brothers in Nigeria. So he said he wanted the Sudan land, you know, and they gave it to him. And yes, they said it's better than fighting. And I said, and I, he said, if you give me that, I won't ask for anything again. I'm okay. It's just like our friend in Moscow. And the Crimea. Can you see he's not satisfied with the Crimea? He's gotten the Crimea now, but he's still knocking on the door of Ukraine. You know why? He wants the old Soviet empire back. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. He was what he was. Balta, you all those places are all satellite states under him. And he wants to have full control. 
and dictate policy from Moscow. It's the same spirit. Same devil. Anyway, getting back to Adolf Hitler, I'm going to relate to Nigeria and we're going to close. How many people are getting anything out of this? I am. So this guy, he, he consolidates his power. And when he is strong, and they gave the Sudan land, builds his armies and his tanks, and all his, you know, military something, all that time they were practicing Blitzkrieg. They were practicing, ah, the German, the German Luftwaffe was the most powerful air force in the world. The German Navy became, they used to go for courses in America. They would say, oh yes, they would send German marine officers and they would send them to the U.S. In fact, one of them said, he said, only the United States Navy professionally compares with the German Navy. They said, well, the British too are strong. He said, yes, but the British are, they are, you know, they are old now. They don't understand modern warfare. And he was right. The German generals were given, they had done by between 35 and 39, they had drawn f- plans for the whole world. Case white, case yellow, that's what they were called in code. First of all, we invade Poland and Eastern Europe. Then after that, we would deal with France and the Low Countries. Then after that, we would take England. When we solidify ourselves on the Western Front, we will now turn to Russia and we will have a German Empire from the Atlantic to the Urals. That is from England right down across Europe. That was the plan. It was all written down. Only the very top brass of the German army knew anything about it. The, 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 his close inner circle so he says, we're going to execute Clay White. He said there was no question of. It was a plan. As, as early as 1940, 41, the German uh, uh, scientists had already designed bombs that could fly, intercom- missiles that could fly across. They were perfecting how to do remote control. What do you think we are trying to do now? You know, how you could fire a missile, it would go and you would direct it by radar, and uh, sorry, by radio, and, and remote control to something. They were practicing, they were doing all the research. He was so confident. There was nobody in the world that was close to them in technology. And in all of these things, thank God for prayer. The only thing that won World War II was prayer. It was just the mercy, mercy of God. I said all that to say this. We'll be very naive as Christians. And I thank God for this message Pastor Wally has brought. If we don't learn from history... And we don't see beyond the mere political and economic and all of that and see the spiritual reasons and forces that are behind what is going on. This election is don't you be deceived for one second. And we must not sell our birthright for a piece of pottage. Pastor Wally mentioned some things during the message. Incidentally, uh, uh, Pastor Port and Howard Carter and all these guys, they began to pray against uh, Adolf Hitler. And through their prayers and intercession, even though they were not even as strong as they should have been, that's why it took such a long time. It took six years, 39 to 45. And 50 million people died of which 20 million alone came from the Soviet Union. Six million Jews were incinerated, (laughs) burnt alive, including babies and children. You want to see the devil? He came down. What we're seeing now with ISIS uh, is, is a foreplay. God will not allow us to be complacent and let them come in. Yes, 
crematoria. They were born. See, by the time they finished, 30, 19, 4, 39, hadn't they just I have a concentration camp? If you're a Jew or you're a gypsy, you know, or you're from one of these, you know, lower Slavs, he considered them black. You don't even exist. <laughs> <laughs> God forbid that Rudolf Hitler should have won that war. This place would be one big agricultural research farm. They'll all be taking you and put. <laughs> you're not even. You are not even close to a Jew, <laughs> which they look down on. Black. When a black man won the Olympic in 1936, Hitler stormed out of the stadium. Jesse Jones. He won the hundred meters. Jesse Owens, he wondered, I don't, in front, I, I don't know why people don't think. You know, there's little things like that that will let you know the kind of person he, in the middle of an international, conf, you know, something, he was so angry, he just got up and walked out. Like, uh, <laughs> 30, 1940, 41, when he, won, when he had defeated France, defeated all the six weeks, he was so strong, he was so powerful. You know, he was thinking, there's nobody like me in all the earth. I'm the conqueror of Europe. You know, it was God. Oh. It was God. And people pray. God gave the British Empire radar. And the uh, Spitfire. <laughs> Spitfire had a whole higher altitude and better maneuverability than the German jets. So they would go, you know, so they were not able to defeat Britain in the air. Winter came. So once winter came, they could no longer do an Atlantic crossing. They could not no longer do an invasion. So everything went back to uh, <laughs> So kind of like kind of a girl. It was during that time, God, through prayer. He said, I said, um, 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 uh, Adolf Hitler said he had a meeting with his general and said, Well, you know, Britain is already defeated. And Britain is not our natural enemy anyway. They are irons like us. We have, we have the same race. They, they are not, they said they can keep their empire if they like. They're already defeated, you know. And I know that the reason why Churchill. You know, he's still hanging on and has, he has two hopes. One, America. Because America can come and help him. Two, because he hated um, um, FDR. <laughs> you know, Roosevelt. You know, yeah, he has a hope. America. And Russia. He's just waiting for me. You know, uh, sorry, Stalin. Stalin is waiting for me to get embroiled in a channel crossing so that he can attack me from the east. Therefore, I'm going to give you the next strategy for the German armed forces, now that we are at our strength and at our peak, we will attack the Soviet Union. You know, Operation Barbarossa. He says, we will make it a quick summer campaign. Six weeks. These were his words. We will just kick our door through the door and the whole rotten structure will come tumbling down. They didn't even prepare winter clothes. That's how confident he was. That thought alone won the war. Pulling down strongholds. Bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That thought and he, all his generals advised him against it. All of them said, ah, you said you will never fight a two front war. He said we are at our strongest. England cannot, cannot attack us. He said, it's a six-week, he said, yeah, yeah. He said, it's a six-week summer campaign. We will just quickly, you know, once we, once we consolidate the, this was his plan. We will just quickly defeat Russia. Once we defeat Russia, I will make, listen to this, <laughs> and get the oil, exactly. He said, I will quickly make a peace meeting with the Western powers and we'll close the war. That thought alone. So he withdrew from attacking England, he concentrated on the Soviet Union. He had to wait until the summer. So 
that did not start until July 1941. During that time, England started getting stronger. America began to watch what was going on and they began to prepare. They had to say the war, but they just began to prepare because they said, this guy, you know, there's no time. In fact, FDR had no, FDR had said, there's no time we're not going to fight. The American people in America didn't want America to join the war. FDR said, there is no way we're not going to join this war. This was his, this was, they had a press conference with him. He said, if your neighbor's house is on fire, and you do not help him to get water hose to put out the fire, he said the fire will soon spread to your own house. He didn't say I will go fight Germany. Praise the Lord. <laughs> he just told them. And that's how, that's how FDR, you know. <laughs> and so they just left it like that. So in that one year, they began to build tank, build bomb, build everything. They was getting ready. Because it was inevitable. And the leopard will never change his spots. He that has an heir, he will not, he's going, he's, he's not going to change. Hello, he was still. He was still. He, I, I told you he had case white, case yellow. He had plan right to finish the. Whole, and once he's finished the whole, once he comes to all Europe, is America is not a problem. The Americans, thank God, they entered the war. They did not know that Adolf Hitler had already developed an intercontinental ballistic missile. If they would have just been sitting in New York with nuclear warhead. Had they, had they not joined the fight and thought they were secure because they were a, an ocean away, they would have had a rude shock. Thank God for FDR. Thank God for people who are praying. Second thing that won the war, now concentrated on, on, um, on the Soviet Union, you know, and then he got broke because of the winter and all of that. Then he went to North Africa because of oil. And let me say something here. It has, has prophetic relevance here. One of the reasons, what oil was a strategic reason because there was oil in the Arabian desert. All this Algeria, Libya, Morocco, you know, there was oil in there. And he needed that oil. So that he, to power his tanks and his machines and everything. So that's why he attacked North Africa. But those North Africa, especially Egypt, were British colonies. So that was why there was the North African War. The theater of the, of, of, of the war in, in North Africa. The British had to, had to you know, um, uh, uh, to defend the place. But a stronger spiritual reason was where was Palestine? Lucifer, knowing that God's prophetic time clock would not start until the nation of Israel was formed, Adolf Hitler would have captured what is called Palestine today and there would have been no Israel. And therefore, the prophetic end time clock would never have started. Don't just look at things on the surface. So, there were some young mathematicians in Cambridge, 1940, 41. The Germans always were sending coded messages to all their tanks and all their uh, military commanders, both in the sea and in the air, and it's called Enigma. Nobody could break that code. And God, God, just, they were four of them. Mary. Four and one lady. The one went for to one, one, um, the top guy was in Cambridge called Turin. You know, in fact, they just did a film on him. Although the guy had some other problems anyway, but <laughs> you know, and they got together and they began to think on this problem. They worked on it and worked on it and worked on it. Somehow, God gave them a breakthrough. It's not demo. I want to say that too. It's not it God. Some people are praying in the background. And then, you know, because they, they broke the code. And you know what they did? After they broke the code, they didn't do anything so that the, 
the, the guys will not know that the code was broken. So they will know he's going to attack the convoy. They won't, they won't do anything. They say, because if we do, they will know that we have broken the code. So some people died. For the bigger picture. The only people that knew were Winston Churchill, some of the few scientists, and some of the didn't, they didn't say. Then when the North African campaign began to gain momentum and they sent in Montgomery, you know, they now started releasing little by little. So when the Germans want to go here, they will radio the British and get the code. So everything they were doing, the British knew. That was how Monty defeated Rommel in the Desert War. Those two things, Russia, Raider, and the Kurd, that's what won the war. If that, if those things didn't have a, Hitler was too strong. There was no way anybody could defeat him. Now, here we are in 19, in 2015. Pastor Wale gave us a little bit of a historical background. SPC started in 1984. That's very true. But do you know that it was exactly 1989 that we began to give those prophetic messages? Manchild Company, Joshua Generation, Times and Seasons, all of them were preached in 1989. I now gave a prophetic message and declaration in 1990 when all the churches in Ibadan came together in Orita Mepha and I preached on the tabernacle of Moses and prayer. The thing the church should have used and why did they reject it? Because it, it involves hardness. You know, one thing about this, this, if you look at uh, what I'm about to share with you will really help you if you will hear it and you will discipline yourself. And the mercy and the grace of God is there. You know one of the reasons why this message is so hard? I tell you. For you to do these things I'm asking you to do, you have to tithe your time. So that comes to about, let's say, two and a half hours. Consider prayer daily. To do that, you have to go to bed early and you have to wake up. If you wake up at six, you are finished. <laughs> you have to be at work by eight. So there's only one answer. You have to get up around four to five. It's hard on the body. That's why it's endure hardness. When you do that concentrated prayer, you now lay the foundation for praying with your thoughts. So that the ones every six hours and the praying with your thoughts in between can be effective based on that foundation. That's why it's hard. But the good news is this. If you will endure that hard enough, that your body will get used to it. <laughs> Your whole system, it says, labor therefore to enter into rest. Let me, I've never shared this before, but I'm going to share it now. Do you know why groaning is so hard at first? I, be, I, I was part of it, so I know. You know why it's so hard? The sin nature in your system. So that's why when we first started groaning, we used to make a lot of noise. But if you are coming from Songbo, you will hear us here. We will be wondering, but she where is she one day? I even remember one day I went to preach in Kaduna. They came to knock on the door of the hotel. Remember, Pastor Boyga? They came to knock on the door of our of our room in the hotel. But is everything all right? This is 1990, 91, 92. You know, we couldn't help it. We had to make noise. Now, notice the Bible talk about strong crying. Did he say loud crying? The fact that a crying is strong does not mean it has to be loud. What makes it is because of the sin nature. But once the sin nature gets out, as you flush it out, you will find you can groan very idle. I can be groaning and you won't hear me. 
but it's very intense here. I can grow quietly. I can grow. <clears throat> I don't need to do that anymore. Now I do if I need to, but what I'm saying is you, 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 it's the resistance, the sin nature inside the flesh. When you come against it, that's why it comes. <clears throat> Once it starts going down, you will still be able to pray very effectively with groanings. Without necessarily making a loud noise. And then it's easier on the flesh. It's there. But then now you'll find the yoke easy and the burden light. It's the yoke of life scriptures and the burden of travail. We, we had to go through all of So we had to endure hardness. <laughs> we had to endure. A lot of people left. A lot of people got offended. But what kept us was it was the word of God. See, I didn't invent the Bible. These things were written before I was ever born. So I knew I was on the right track by the grace of God and I stayed with it. Now, finally, the last thing I will say here is what Pastor Wally also mentioned. So endure that hardness. Those the first six months, two, one, two years. If you stay with it, after a while, the thing will go down, and you you will find you still you as long as if you don't have to say, but you will find that it's easy. It's, it becomes easy. It's no longer as hard as it used to be. You know, even your whole system, like Mom was saying, you know, you pray before you sleep. Bam, four o'clock, your, your eyes wake up. Amen. And I taught these things, you know, in bits and pieces over the years. But you have to listen comprehensively, you know. Even getting up early in the morning, you know, you can have alternate days. The days you get up very early, the days you rest more. And the next day, you get up very early. The next, you know, you just balance it, mix it with all night. You will find that it will average out. And it will average out to that two and a half hours of concentrated prayer. Another thing I've learned to do, you know, and I've taught you also, is to pray a lot with communion prayer throughout the day. You know, you're in the car, you're going to the bank, be praying. Uh-huh. Amen. Meta. Hello, I shall know you. Mary. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen and commune with your thoughts. That way you will become spiritual in the midst of carnal activity. We are in this world. We're not going to go and stay in monastery. We're going to live here. So I've learned and I'm still learning. You know, I pray in the car. I pray in the airport. I pray, you know. And when I'm with people who are not praying, people and all that, I keep my mouth shut and I pray with my thoughts. <laughs> I'm praying all the time. It can be done. We have proven by practice that it can actually be done. That is why this generation doesn't have an excuse. <laughs> they cannot say it cannot be done. Look at people like Dr. Williams. Look at people like Professor Carl Deolokwari and many others who, okay, you say, okay, we are pastors, but there are people who are not even in, they are not, they are not in, they are in secular employment and they are doing it. That is why judgment will come to those who don't do it. Just like judgment came to Ananas and Sapphira when others gave everything and told the truth. They didn't give everything and told a lie. But because a bar, a standard had been raised, they were judged by the standard that had been raised. And that's what God is going to do. Finally, we talked about, you know, we're not the only ones. And that's very true. You know, and there's a 7,000 as not bad as me, it's need to build. You know, but how does this work? It's so simple. You know, what God is actually doing now, that's why we are, it is true, Pastor Wally, we are not the only one. We may be a spearhead, but we're not the only ones. So when we pray in the spirit, God synchronizes our prayer. So there are people in Sokoto, there are people in, in, in Calabar, there are people, you know, in, in, in Kotangora, there are people in Lagos, they are they're praying spirit. And they have the right heart. Not everybody has the right knowledge. 
But once they have the right heart, the mercy of God comes and takes their prayers. That's why it's called unity of the spirit. We all pray in the same language. It's called tongues. So God will now take the prayer of the guy in Kano and the prayer of the guy in Kalaba and the prayer of the guy in Oyo and the prayer of the guy in Ushobu who has a right heart and is seeking God, praying in spirit, he will take his prayer and he will join it to our own here. I call him a sephiroth. To then pull down strong. And that's why we cannot boost and say it is us. Because yes, we prayed. But if God did not join the prayers of others to our own, our own prayer will not be enough. That's why he said, I have reserved unto me 7,000 that have not bowed their feet, their, their, their knee unto Baal. You have pe- I meet them all the time. You have people on this ground. They love God. They just don't know. They don't know what we know. You know but their heart is there. And at least they baptize the Holy Ghost and they speak in tongues. That's enough for God. <laughs> Very interesting. In the house of Cornelius, do you understand? They didn't have any knowledge. They had no background. They, didn't, they were not disciples of John the Baptist, like John and, and Peter and others. You know, the Holy Ghost just fell. <laughs> and they began to speak in tongues. All they had was a right heart. They had zero knowledge. Do you notice that Peter didn't teach them about the Holy Ghost? He didn't teach them about, you know, receive it by faith. And then, you know, when you think about you, raise your voice. I'm like, we teach. No, nothing. Yes. Very interesting. It was, <laughs> this is revelation knowledge. It was the tongues. It was with the, they were speaking in tongues too. They were not speaking in English, but he's speaking in tongues. They said sinner's prayer. They received the blood. They got born again. Everything in all in tongues. Because it is with the heart man believeth, but it is the mouth confession is made known. So they must have made some confession. It was all done in tongues. Do you see why Satan is so afraid of tongues? <laughs> Finally. This is the judgment part. It has a good part and it has a bad part. Now, the good part, let let me start with the bad part. Then I'll close with the good part and then we'll pray and close and go home. The good part is this. All right, the bad part is this. Those who don't listen now and who don't obey God, they're still in church. But like what happened in the wilderness. See, if God allowed Boko Haram to come here, they would never get here. But if God allowed it, if, if God brought judgment upon the whole nation, which they deserved, but God held it because of the remnants. Do you understand? But those who were supposed to have done what they should have done, that's why God said, I won't destroy the whole nation. He said, but those men who have seen my glory, he said, they will not enter the land and they will perish in the wilderness. That's the bad news. Any disobedient Christian who is alive today, who will not obey the prophetic and apostolic preaching, teaching, and instruction will perish in the wilderness. They will see, but they will not taste of children of Israel in the, in, the, in the wilderness they say oh, that whole generation they perish in the wilderness but God did that so that the whole nation because what God wanted to do was to wipe out the whole nation then Moses I've been preaching some of this on Sunday Moses ah, God, God said okay chill <laughs> I won't destroy everything I'll just deal with the people who opposed me And then I'll preserve the children. And the children will enter the land. That's what's going to happen. That's the bad news. Now let me give you the good news. The good news is this. If, after you have heard all of these things, you make up your mind, 
It's a choice thing. It's a, it's a heart. God looks at the heart. You say, God, have mercy on me. Have God will hear and he will give you mercy and grace and he will strengthen you. I've said it over and over and over and over again and I will not stop saying it. God does not demand immediate perfection. If he did, he would be unfair. But he doesn't demand immediate practice. Start practicing these things. Yes, you will fall. God knows that already. A just man falls seven times but rises again. God, God, you won't do it properly. Don't worry. But practice. And don't stop practicing. Ask for wisdom. Does any lack wisdom? Let him ask of God. I just gave you some now. You know? And you know, God, God told me, he said, he said, son, I have allowed you to be like an example to show people that you can live a normal life. I'm married. I have children. As my pastors, I enjoy myself. I watch a nice movie. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Do you understand? So you don't have to be some cranky fellow that is living in some mountain somewhere, you know, to be spiritual. It's not true. I've proven it. It's a lie. You can, you can be very spiritual. You can be very spiritual in the middle of all your of, of, of natural life. And live a nice, clean life. I enjoy yourself richly. God's blessed me my financially. I enjoy, my, but I don't indulge you. I enjoy myself. I enjoy all things richly. You know, I've proven, and I'm still proving by the grace of God, it's possible. You can live it clean. You you can do all these things. You can do them. I'm doing them, and still be. A nice person and, and have a nice life, you know, live a good life and all of that. Like I told you to know Lua when she was a young girl at the age of 15. I said, the devil has told you a lie that you have to sin to enjoy. It's a lie. You have to do drugs, sex, and alcohol. If you go to a party, you want a kilo, kilo harp. You know what I mean? <laughs> sex, drugs, alcohol. No, no, those are the cousin go to shell and bear. Pastor G, you're right. Well, cousin God don't happen. The devil is a liar. It's not true. You don't have to. You can enjoy all things richly and still live a clean and holy life. Let us pray. Everybody stand to your feet. On the Air has been brought to you by Christ Life Ministries, the outreach arm of the Scripture Pastor Christian Center. You can be a part of this program by becoming a faith partner with Christ Life Ministries. For details, contact Christ Life Ministries, number 12, Oshutoku Avenue, Bodija Ibadan. You can also download our weekly messages from our website, www.spcconline.org, while our email address is scripturepastor at spcconline.org. You're welcome to worship with us at the Scripture Pastor Christian Center Auditorium, Polytechnic Road, Songo Ibadan. God bless you.